The Appalachian Mountains are absolutely gorgeous, but beneath that old fog is many scary and mysterious things. That old breeze carries stories of mountain witches that can send a chill down your spine. Back in the late 1800s in lower eastern West Virginia, way back in the sticks, was an old woman. An old woman named Jenny that everybody feared. Now they say old Jenny was a short lady, poor as a whooper will, rarely spoke, but when she did, everybody listened. She lived by herself except for a ton of old crows that followed her everywhere she went. No matter where she was, they said them old crows would litter the ground and tops of buildings and everything. Old Jenny would rarely come into town. She knew how to work the land she had in the mountains that surrounded her old cabin. But when she did, folks kept their distance and wouldn't dare look in her eye. Well, I got that started. Just one day, many years before that, she had come into town to do a little trading on some spices, herbs, and things like that for a little flyer and lamp oil. Said she rarely spoke and would just point with her left finger. She always kept her right hand covered up by a cloth or a lengthened sleeve. When she left the general store, said a boy was running down the side of the road there. He was born to a wealthy family and run right into her, knocking everything out of her arms and spilling her flyer. Said she just stared at the boy. Said his daddy seen it. He come over there and got up in Jenny's face. Said, you need to watch where you're going, old woman. Said, you better be glad you didn't hurt my son. They said old Jenny just snapped. Said she just dropped the rest of what she had in her arms right there on the ground. Said them old crows started just crowing like crazy. Said she eased up to that boy's daddy and lifted her right hand, revealing a real long, twisted, bony, gnarled up finger. Said it was much longer than any of her other fingers. Said she said in a raspy yet unsettlingly calm voice, You ever so much as even speak to me again, Ned Barr, your words shall rot out of your mouth. Said he stood there for a second, started to say something else, and then began to cough. Said he grabbed at his mouth and his throat, and said his tongue was swelling out of his mouth. It startled the boy picked up her stuff for her. The people run over to him as she's a-walking away. Said the further she got, the more the swelling went down. Hence the name, Jenny Badfinger. Said one day, said a man showed up at her cabin. He was trying to steal one of her chickens. Said he run around there and caught it. They were just about to run away with it. Said when the back door snapped open as he was a running by, said he stopped dead in his tracks. Said she asked him, What do you think you're doing? Said he said, I'm So sorry, ma'am. Said, I don't mean no harm to nobody or nothing. Said, I'm just starving. She said, it again your belief to ask a body for a bite to eat? He said, no, ma'am, dropped his head. She said, yeah, just easier to steal it, ain't it? Says she invited the man in, set him down at the table. She scrummaged around there, made him a little bit of cornbread, stuff, you know, made him a little bite to eat and fed him. Said he later told everybody, said, as he was a-leaving, she stopped him. 
said, you don't steal from me. Said she pointed her bad finger at him and said, her eyes turned gray, gloss-like, almost looking like corpse eyes, and said, if you ever steal from another, them hands will never grab nary another thing for you. Said she lowered her hands and her eyes went back to the normal color and he left. Said later on he must have stole again. Said but true to her words, said that man's hands drawed up and curled up to where he could barely dress himself. Said a local man and woman visited her one day. Said she's out there tending to her chickens and things like that. Said they asked her if and she had bewitched her cattle and stock and stuff like that. Cows wouldn't give milk or nothing. Said she looked at them, slowly turned her head and looked at them over her shoulder and said, weren't my doings. And they said, well, somebody did. She said, there's more than one of my kind in these parts. I just don't hide like the rest of them. So they started to ask her a couple more questions. Said they could tell she's getting highly agitated. She said, she told him, said, where well, I told you now, weren't none of my doings. You best mosey on. Said the man tipped his hat and bid her good day. Said him and his wife was walking away. When the lady spotted a hole dug over there in the corner, almost looked like a grave. Said in his ass, who's gonna be buried there? Said old Jenny looked at her and said, nobody, yet. Said the man woman left and never returned. They said old Jenny lived to be a ripe old age of 102. Said one day, one of the neighbors woke up, and went out to tend their cattle, horses, things like that, in their fields. And off in the distance, heard crows calling like just weren't no tomorrow or anything like nothing they'd ever heard before. Well, said when it didn't stop for hours and hours and hours, they decided to go see what it was. Said the old farmer went and got his oldest boy. So they went up there to see what it was. Said they followed the sound up there and they noticed it Jenny's. Said she was laying there in that hole. Said a simple note was in her hand. Said cover me and feed my babies. Said the entire property, house, ground, trees, everything was littered with cawing crows. Said soon they started to cover her up. The cawing ceased a little bit, started to calm down some. Said after that, a lot of the locals and things heard about what her last wishes was and said they come up there and leave breadcrumbs seed all kind of things from old crows and they said them old crows stayed there and fed for quite a few days and said slowly they just stopped coming around but after that there was a whole lot of older folks that said they'd see old Jeannie walking through them woods. Said oftentimes you'd hear a whole mess of them old crows a call and things like that. Said you might see a whole bunch of them just littering in a tree or something or other. Said it wouldn't be just a few seconds. Sometimes it was just a glimpse. But they'd see old Jenny. So I urge you. You ever back in the hills of West Virginia? And you up our way back in them old hills? Hunting? Hiking? Anything? 
Just seeing the views. If you was to hear a mess of old crows are calling, it just might be old Jenny. From a terrifying witch's ghost to a witch whose face kept changing in front of a crowd of folks. Turn off all the lights and join me for more true stories of Appalachian Mountain Witches. <laughs>back in the 1930s I think it was they said there was a lady they called her Augie which was short for Augustine and Miss Augie they said that she lived back in the, they said she lived way back in the sticks like most folks did back in the Appalachian back then but I reckon she lived extra, extra deep back in the woods. But a lot of folks went to her. Said a lot of folks went to her for a lot of different reasons. Some folks went to her to cure warts. Or other folks would go to her to help try to get their true love to fall in love with them. Yeah, I reckon old Aggie could do just a little bit of everything. And most folks had ordered. Well, one day, said old Aggie, got out her old walking stick. And this old dog, Ben, said she loved that old dog. Said that old dog was so old, said it was old as time, didn't have a tooth in his head. And wouldn't buy the biscuit. So that old was the friendliest dog you'd ever see. Well, they both took off walking into town, a store down there. Get her some cornmeal and some flour and stuff like that. Well, while she was in there, there was some teenagers outside, and you know how teenagers can be sometimes. Well, said them kids out there was teasing old Ben. They're stomping their feet at him, throwing rocks at him, scaring him half to death. Well, she heard the commotion going on, looked out the, win out the window there, saw what was happening. Said she never said a word. So she grabbed her stick, walked off, and left everything on the counter. So she walked outside, said they all stopped and just looked at her. So she told them, said, now you, so she told them, said, now you youngins get on out of here. You leave my dog be. He ain't done nary a thing to you. I said they started laughing at her, poking fun at her, making fun of her clothes, her hair, and things like that. Said so she told him, said, I will not tell you again. Go on. Well, one of them, trying to be brave in front of the rest of them, walked over to her. Walked over close to where she was standing. And asked her just what she was going to do if they didn't. And then he kicked old Ben right in the side. Well, they said she got so mad. Said she gripped her stick so hard. You could hear the wood a-popping. Said they made big eyes and started stepping back. Said she got so angry, said that she was mumbling, weren't even talking, weren't even saying words or nothing, said she was just a mumbling. Well, said so about that time, they all got the scare of their life. 
because her face started changing, shifting from one face to another. Said so one face would be real young, the next one would be real old, one face would even turn to a man and then shift right back into a woman. I well, said them youngest took off running as hard as they could. One lady that had seen what was going on walked over to her and said, what do you think you're doing to them kids? She said she jerked her head to the side and stared her right dead in the eye. She said when she did, her pupils dilated. She said a clap of thunder rolled across the sky and shook the ground. She said the general store owner come back out there with her stuff. Told everybody to go on, they weren't nothing to see there. He saw what happened and apologized to her. Told her that never happened at his door again. Closed up the shop and escorted her home. Made sure nobody messed with her and old Ben along the way. Now they said from there on, any time that she went into town, said folks would come from all around town to pet old Ben, give him treats, and scratch his belly, and tell him he's a good boy. Now this story here, this one comes from deep in the heart of Alabama. Late 1800s. Said there was a lady who practiced witchcraft, her and her two sisters. But now she was the only one that practiced witchcraft. Now the other ones, they said that they, they didn't fool with it. But said that she was also shunned from her family, society, and things like that. Because back in the end times was different. You know, and anybody that was different well, they was shunned from the community. Folks just stayed away from them. Wouldn't have nothing to do with them. And I reckon this lady was one of the lady witches that practiced the dark arts. Well, I guess she got to, used to being by herself and things like that. I reckon she lived to be an old woman. but nobody dared cross her or made her mad. Well, they said during her funeral, so there was only four people that showed up. Her two sisters and a husband and wife that the two sisters knew, but the whole community reported a sin black cats everywhere throughout the community and through the woods. Said so them old cats would come, to, come together at night right as the moon come up. Said so they all gathered around her headstone and sat there and squalled at the moon. Now they said this lady didn't mess with nobody but she didn't like to be messed with, neither. And you know, kids being kids. Back in, they said that she had a little grave that was up on a little, up on a little hill. It said that teenagers used to gather up and dare one another to go up there and knock on her tombstone because it was said that if you go up there and you knock on her tombstone 
and tell her he was there to take her cat. She'd make sure that didn't happen. Well, one night, there's a few boys and a few gals out walking around, a sparking. That's what they called dating back in. And they just out walking around, walking through the woods. When they happened to come around the corner up on the area where she was buried at, and it was getting kind of late. Well, one of them wanted to show out in front of the gals. Got to talking about her. Being just right at the hill. And said he was so brave that he didn't care a bit to go up there and knock. Said he got a big old grin. Here he went. Said by that time it was just about dusky dark. You could barely see from the moonlight. Said the closer they got, the more they noticed. There were no critters around, no insects, no crickets, nothing. Anybody who lives in the woods can tell you. Anytime you're in the woods, you're going to hear critters, crickets, insects. But when it's dead silent, there's something badly wrong. Well, they said that nothing could be heard. But didn't phase him a bit. So they tried to talk him out of it, but that made it even worse. He just kept a going, hollering the whole time. Well, said he went up there. And said that the more closer they got, the more scared they got. So the other three said they turned around and went back toward the main trail. They said it weren't just a couple of minutes. They said, here he comes. So he come a running out of them woods just as fast as his feet could fly. Said he run past them, they was hollering at him, figuring he was just trying to scare them. So they didn't put much into it. Said he run past them. Kept on going. Well, said they took off after him. And finally caught up to him and got him stopped. Said he was so scared he couldn't say a word. Said that there was a big old white streak through the right side of his hair. Well, I reckon after they got him calmed down a little bit, enough to where he could kind of tell him what happened. Said he went up there and he knocked like he said he was going to. Said he heard something. And he thought it was them. So he started laughing. So he turned around. So as soon as he turned around, he said, there she was. Right behind him. So she let out a shriek. And said her eyes was glazed over. And said her mouth opened and wider and wider and wider till it was almost down to her chest. So then she reached out and grabbed him. So when they all got to looking, said he got to showing them. They pulled his shot top of his shirt down there where they could see it. He said, sure enough, said there was a scratch right on his chest. Just below his neck. And said and that scratch was in the perfect shape of a cat. Now they said that that wound healed. But they said for till he got, even when he was an old man, said that scar could still be seen. 
Now this next story here takes us way back into the hills of Kentucky. Back years ago, when I was a fairly young fellow, I remember hearing my great uncle. He was an old fellow back then. I remember hearing him tell a tale. Said when he was a young man. Said him and his brothers used to love you know, just walking through the woods. You know. Back then, most folks had to walk pretty much everywhere they went or rode a horse. Well, said they was out walking one evening. And said they was going to cut across this field to get home. A little shortcut. Said they was a little field, you know, a little patch of woods, and then the road that went home. Well, said they cut through there. So as they was going through the field, getting near to the wood line, said they were just getting some eerie feelings. Like they just shouldn't be there. Said they, he looked at his brother Eli and said, you know, maybe we ought to turn around and go back the other way. He said, I just ain't feeling right about this. They something ain't right. Said Eli told him, oh, ain't nothing to that. Come on now. I said, this just get through these little patch of woods here and get to the house. Well, said so they cut through them woods. Said so they had never been through the woods before. So well, said so when they cut through there, so they come up on like a little clearing, which was the edge of a pond. Well, well, said so they was walking through there, said, as they got closer, they could see there was people out there. They was wondering what they was doing, said. So they hunkered down, kind of snuck up there. Being young fellas, they just being nosy. Well, said they got on their, down on their bellies and elbows and crawled up where they could just, you know, get a pretty good view. And there was about six or seven women. They thought, oh, some pretty gals. Said about that time, so they started taking their clothes off. Well, he said the decent thing to do would be to turn your head. He said, but we couldn't. He said, not because of the fact that they were taking their clothes off. He said, because of the fact that one of them had a book. He said, big old book. He said, would reach from your fingertips probably to your elbows. He said, old book. He said, looked almost ancient. Well, said that two of them got in the water. Well, said one of them sitting there holding that book. Started reciting from it. Said they couldn't hear what she was saying, but she was reciting something from it. Said she got in the, said them two got in the water and turned away from the sun. And said she read that book, said she read about two sentences and stopped. Said she closed the book. Said something, so they all hurried out and put the clothes back on. So they were wondering what was scaring them off. And there weren't nothing in the water that scared them off. He said as soon as they got their clothes on, said every one of them turned and faced them. And he said there was no way they wouldn't they could know they was there. He said they never made a noise. He said one of them brought out a big old knife and pointed it at them and called out their names. He said he'd never been so scared in his life. He said they jumped up, screaming top of their lungs, hollering, run, fast as they could, and all the way home. He said, as far as he knew, he, they didn't even stop to take a breath. So they got home, run in the house, shut the door. 
scared them half to death, but they felt better being home. Well, so after a little while, so they, you know, they talked about it a little bit, but after a while, they started calming down. The day kind of went back to normal. Well, said so that night, they started hearing a hoot owl just right outside the window. I said, Lord, I can't get no sleep because that hoot owl. So he got up and went over to the window. I'm going to shoot off. So he raised his wind, leaned out of it. He said they weren't an owl in sight. He said when he looked down, he said as he was leaning back in, pulling the window back, they pulled the window back down. He said there was that dagger sticking in his window sill. He said from then on out, no matter if it was pouring rain, storming, it didn't matter. He said they never walk back through them woods ever again. Listen here, there's nothing that comes from here in Tennessee. And I remember hearing one of my friends, his granny, talk about this. And I said that she remember hearing it from her great granny. I said way back in the old days, he said that uh, there was this man and woman. Old couple. His name was Selby. Her name was Martha. He said they all called her Marthy. And I reckon both of them practiced witchcraft. Well, said everybody loved them, though, because they said that they was... So they'd help people all they could. So they did a lot of herbal stuff. You know, so they helped just as, you know, just anybody they could, you know. Just a standard ma and pa couple, you know. Well, said that uh, as time went by, they got, you know, got even older down in health. Well, said that he went downhill a little quicker than she did. Said all the community had got together and had a little shindig. Well, I reckon old Selby said that he just collapsed of a heart attack. Said they got the doctor in there and said he, they pronounced him dead. Well, said the next day, said they had him out there at the house. Said because back in, you know, folks would have their, you know, lay their kinfolk out there at home. They'd have their casket laid right there in the living room sometimes. Folks could come by and pay their respects. Well, said they buried old Selby in the backyard up on like a little knoll like a little hill by a big old oak tree. Well, said Marthy said she was just beside herself, was upset and things like that, you know. That she couldn't live without him. A few days later, she kept telling everybody she'd be all right in a few days because the new moon was coming in. She'd be all right. The new moon will be in tomorrow. The new moon will be in tonight. You know. Well, said folks kept wondering what she was talking about, but didn't really know, so they didn't push it. Well, said the night of the new moon come in and said they could see uh, the neighbors people driving by and stuff could see a lantern up there next to his grave so didn't think much about it save cause she was up there quite a bit grieving well they said the next day said she's leaving the house you know said she went out and hitched up a horse up to the little buggy that they had. Well, I said she hitched it up and pulled it up there. I said everybody just was standing to her and neighbors and stuff. Kids running around up, you know, playing close community. I said everybody stopped in shock. I said because Selby walked out. So he walked out, got in the buggy, and they left. 
said late that night they come back. Said they done that three days in a row. Well, said somebody, said the doctor kept him. He said, well, now, you know, there is a possibility maybe we just misdiagnosed him. It has been, you know, known to happen. Well, said that uh, everybody kind of let it go, but said that he just didn't act the same. So he just had to, you know, kind of different. But where everybody thought the world of him, they just let it go. Well, said, uh, a few days after that, he was out there in his garden, collapsed again. Again, they pronounced him dead, same thing, buried him in the same spot. Said it weren't long, he was back again. Well, they said that this went on and happened about four or five times. See, folks got to where they know something weren't right somewhere. Folks would stay away from them. wouldn't talk to them. Tell the youngins, don't even look at them. So it eventually got to where Selby would stand and just stare into nothing. And said so would stand for hours and hours at a time, just staring into nothing. Well, said one night they got into a big old argument or something. So everybody got up, and they was gone. House was empty. Barn was empty. No sign of them anywhere. Just like they packed up and just left in the middle of the night, where it was a mighty strange occurrence. Awfully strange stuff. Folks just, you know, just weren't natural. Folks still wondered, where'd they go? And is it possible that that weren't the first time it happened? Folks then started to wonder, just how old was they? How many times did both of them pass? and they'd bring each other back? Or was it just simply a case of misdiagnosis four or five times? As always, I'll let you be the judge of that. You know, here in the Appalachians, deep under all that old fog that rolls across these mountains, there's a whole lot of tales of witches. These goes back hundreds of years. This next in here comes from my friend's grandma. It goes back to West Virginia. Long time ago. Back in the beginning of the 1900s. When her mama was little. Said they lived in a little holler. And there was a path that her and her brothers had to stay away from. Said that path came out of the hills across the house, which connected to another path that passed their home that went into town. Well, from time to time, they noticed an old woman with an old, dusty, and dirty cloak. They'd come out of the path from the hills and use the trail to go into town. Well, she asked her mama who she was because she always stopped and stared at the house a minute. Then she'd go on. Her mama said to stay away from her because she was a witch. One morning, her and her brother was out gathering up eggs from the hens. Said they was a toting them back to the house when all of a sudden there she was 
said her little brother screamed and ran to the house. Except for a second, she froze. And then she noticed something. Said she didn't look scary under that cloak. Said she just looked like a little old woman. Says she asked her, Ma'am, what's your name? And why does everybody scare you? Says she just stared at her. I said, why ain't you running? She said, what, well, should I? Says she stood there for a second and reached down to her basket she's toting and dug out four eggs, handed them to her and smiled. Said she never said nary a word. Just turned and left. Said she went inside. And told her brother not to say a word about it or that old witch come back and get him. So he never said nothing. Well, that following winter was a real long, hard one. Temperatures dropped way below zero. And frost and snow covered them old mountains like you wouldn't believe. Well, her daddy and her brother took off to go hunting. It's going to be gone a few days. That night, it was just her and her mama. Well, way up in the night, she woke up and heard her mama moaning and groaning. Said she took a fever. Her being a little girl said she didn't know what in the world to do. So she just sat and cried. Well, it says she was sitting there just rocking back and forth with her head between her knees. And just kind of held her head up. So when she did, out the window, she seen a lantern. Said she thought, oh boy, thank the Lord, Daddy's back. Said she run to the door. And jerked it open and run out of it and run right into the arms of the witch. So that old witch leaned down, grabbed her hand, and said, Where is she? So she still in kind of a little bit of a, a shock, said she didn't know what to do, so said she just pointed. Said she pushed past her. Snow falling off of her as she stormed by. Said she followed her in. After she went into her mama's room, said she went to the doorway and leaned in just enough to see that she had sat on the edge of the bed and was saying something and put a kind of paste looking stuff in her mouth. And took her hand, put it on her cheeks, and was working her jaws till she swallowed it. She got up and walked out. Told that little girl, I said, it'll be okay, girl. Don't fret. So the little girl said she thanked her kindly. Said the old woman walked over and stoked up the fire. Put a big old log in. Shut it down so it'd last all night. Said she was walking out the door and she stopped. Said she turned around glanced over her shoulder. Name's May. Give a slight grin. And went to the little girl. Said she turned around and vanished into the darkness. Said the next morning her mom was feeling a little better. And by nightfall she was back to her old self. Said she never did tell anybody what happened. Till she was an old woman herself. Said from time to time she'd go up that old path. She'd go up and she'd see old May. Sit around visit with her. Talk to her and often brought her eggs and just anything that the, she could sneak off for a spare. Said for many years she visited old May and learned many a thing from her. 
said for a long time she didn't realize. Not only was she making a friend, but she was being trained. But back in the old days here in Appalachia, it was home to a lot of different people, traditions, religions, even witchcraft. Magic of old that came over from Scotland, Ireland, Europe, even Germany. Some used that magic for many different things, oftentimes. The witch, the witch would, as they call it, bewitch somebody and make them or their family have bad fortune or make their chickens stop laying eggs or something like that. But these old folks done some digging, found a few ways to counteract it, like making a witch bottle or what they call a card or a ticket. Now to some people all this may sound very silly or made up, but it's very true. See, back in these hills, where oftentimes you didn't see a soul for days or weeks, it was mighty scary when something started going all wrong and you had no explanation of why or who even really it was doing it to you. Lots of times folks would consult an elder of the family that knew how to deal with some of these things. Other times, they'd have to find another witch to seek counsel with them. I heard a story once about an old-timer named Amos. Now they said old Amos was a good old feller. See, he was always up before the sun to take care of his homestead. Said he was a mighty good fella. Said he had no kids and lost his wife to fever. But he still got up every morning, just like clockwork. Said one day he just stopped coming outside. Didn't tend to his livestock or do his usual daily chores. Well, one day a neighbor paid old Amos a visit, got worried about him. Said old Amos just sat there in his chair staring at a coal fireplace. Said he asked old Amos what was wrong. Said he just said he didn't know. Well, the neighbor began asking around, and a woman heard about it. Well, early one morning, before the sun rose, she went to see old Amos and took one of her friends with her. They said she couldn't read nor write, but she instructed her friend who could to take a piece of paper and write certain words on it. Then they took a piece of his hair and wrapped it up in that paper. They took it to a certain tree and had to be facing east and bored a hole in it. Said so they put that paper in that hole and they took an old wooden peg stuck it in there and struck it three times. On the first tap, they'd say in the name of the Father. Second tap, the name of the Son. And on the third tap, the name of the Holy Ghost. They said that broke it. They said that old son come up and said by dinner time old Amos was back to his normal old self. A recent viewer commented, said they remembered back in the old days. Something had went wrong, they couldn't remember what it was exactly. But said something had went wrong. And they took something took a needle. And they was going to churn some butter. And said they had to stick that needle in that butter and churn it. They said by the time they churned all that to butter. Said that needle weren't nowhere to be found. And whatever it was. It went back to normal. I just wanted to thank you for that comment. I really appreciate that. Now this one here comes from the Tennessee Georgia line. 
back in the 1890s. There was a woman. I never got her name. But just for the sake of the old hell, we'll call her Molly. Old Molly was a strong, independent lady in her late 30s. Had a small little cabin in a beautiful little meadow. Said she had a couple cows, a few chickens, and a few old goats. So one morning she went out and milked the cows and the goats, said because one of the neighbors needed some goat's milk for a bad stomach. Well, that night, said she went to get her some cow's milk only to find that it had all turned to blood. Well, in a scare and panic, she began wringing her hands. She didn't know what in the world to do. She didn't know what had been done to her or have a clue what to do about it or who done it. She said she did the only thing she could think of. She lit her lantern took off walking and walked for miles to see a witch that her family knew. So they knew her for many years. I said the old witch sat there and heard about her, heard her problem and took an old glass bottle. Said she put a handful of old iron nails in it, pointing straight up little hair and one of her fingernails and they, they probably a whole lot more to it but that's the extent to what I was told well she said she told Molly to take that bottle and place it in her hearth she said when them old nails heated up and expanded it would trap the spell well she said she took off walking many miles back home by the time she got back home, it was breaking daylight. It says she did just exactly that. So she placed that old bottle in her hearth and stoked her up a big old fire. And she told her to dig a hole and pour that blood milk into the hole and write something on a, something other on a piece of paper and throw it in it, burn it, and cover it back up. Said she did just that too. Said everything went back to normal. But you know, a lot of times back in the hills, they didn't truly know who was the one that was doing these things to them. So one of the traditions was said that they oftentimes would take a broom and they'd lay it across the front door. It was said that a witch couldn't cross over it where others would put it or hide it over the top of the doorway. And if they told somebody, yeah, come on in, it's good to see you. But if they stopped and wouldn't come in, then they knew. But a lot of times, they'd often use symbols and sigils and carve them into their barns or homes or stuff. There's even often times where they would make a top window and make it crooked so the witches couldn't fly in. It's a story about a witch, but no ordinary witch. It's about a witch the folks never bothered, but would oftentimes go to for help. They said they'd help anybody possible. Witch man Appalachia. And I remember hearing my kin folks tell me. Said that my grandma had a cousin. We kept telling her, said that her leg kept ailing her at night. That means ailing means hurting in Appalachia. Said her leg kept ailing. Said it just kept ailing and ailing night and day. Well, said she finally broke down, went to the doctor, and said they couldn't find no reason for it. Well, said me, my told her, she said, we'll go see the old witch man. Now, as far as I know, nobody ever knowed his name. If they did, they never told me. That's just 
how they knowed him as. They said he was, he was polite. He was an older like feller, kind of quiet, didn't say much, but said he'd listen very carefully. And Tori said, yeah, he's a good one, you need to go see him. She'd said that when she was a little girl, said she got seed warts all over her hands. And said they'd hurt when she tried to wring her hands or use her hands for anything. Well, said her brother Reuben told her, go see the old witch man. She said, good Lord, it had been raining so hard that the birds was building their nests upside down. <laughs> But it said her and her sister finally waited for a break in the rain and then walked into town to the post office and sent him a letter. Well, it said days went by. She began to wonder if he even got it. it said one day she got a letter back. It said he told her. It said I hope he hold her hands out and to count them, to count them seed wars on her hands. And to count them a certain amount of times. And then write that number on a piece of paper and send it back to him. And said as soon as he opened it up, they'd start going away. And they did. Said a few days later she got up. And a few of them was gone. A little bit throughout the day she noticed a few more was gone. And said it kept on to every one of them vanished. Said she wrote him another letter, said, What do I owe you? Said she never got another letter in return. Another time her older sister was cooking up a big old supper for the family gathering. Well, something other happened, and she spilled a big old pot of boiling hot water all over her hands. They said it scalded her bad. Said it was bl instant blisters. Well, said they couldn't find the doctor. And said they tried a few old remedies and stuff and with some herbs and things like that, but it would not help him so bad. Said she was crying in agony. Well, said my great uncle said he loaded her up, headed into town over the next town to see the doctor. Said he stopped for just a little bit of gas. Said he saw the old witch man standing there by the pumps. Said they pulled up, said he got out, and he said he was going to tell the old witch man what was happening. Said before he could even say anything. Said the old witch man smiled and said, What blisters? Said my uncle just stopped. Then he noticed something. She weren't screaming no more. So he turned around and looked. Said she was just sitting there holding her hands up and looking at him and just complete bum fuzzled and, you know, in curiosity. Said my great uncle turned to him, going to try to, try to pay him to thank him. So he just held his hand up and shook his head. He walked around to her. He said he walked around to her side of the window. Said you'll be just fine now and smiled, and just turned and walked off. And they said you could walk up to his house, and even way up in the night, and not make any sound. But by the time you reached the porch, he was coming out the screen door. Said nobody ever went inside. Said he'd always ask you to have a seat, and listen to you and offer you a drink of water. Said often times you'd see him in town. Often you'd see him in the woods gathering things or just walking around. But I've listened to these stories about him fur back as I can recollect. But I can't help but wonder, was he in fact a witch? Or was he just a quiet type of feller, just a healer or something? I mean, I don't know anything about witchcraft or anything like that myself, but if you do, let me know. A long time ago, 
way back in the hills. Folks lived just about anywhere they could find or build. Well, there were some folks that moved into an old house that had an old barn behind it. And there was an old woman that everybody knew as Aunt Delphi. Everybody knew Aunt Delphi as that because nobody ever really knew where she was from, any of her kin, or anything. It was just like she just showed up one day. Well, she lived in that old barn for a long time. And after that family moved in for a long time, it was peaceful. Beautiful. Just fell to home. Friends, family, neighbors alike would often come by and visit because it was on the way to town. Beautiful area. But all that changed one snowy winter's night. They'd all nestled down getting ready for bed. When the old man went and going to stoke up the fire and bank it so it'd stay warm all night. Well, he kept an old rocking chair, as most folks did, in front of the old fireplace. Said he walked outside and got him an armload of wood and a handful of kindling for the next morning. So as he went back in, so there she sat in that rocking chair in an old faded black bonnet and a shawl. Just sitting there rocking. So he just topped and dropped that wood everywhere. And said, Ain't Delphi, what are you doing here? So she never said a word, so she just turned and looked at him. Then turned back to look at the far. Rocked for a minute. And disappeared. Said oftentimes she'd stare through the windows at them. Especially the young ones. Said if they was walking through and passed a window, she'd just push her face up to the window. And if they'd scream, she'd vanish. Well, I reckon this went on for some time. Finally, one day, they noticed she hadn't been out for a spell. Well, as most folks did back in, they got to worrying about her. So somebody went up there to check on her. Only to find that she had passed. The doctor said due to the cold weather, it was really hard to tell exactly by how long she'd been gone. Well, it said that when they had her little old funeral... Said they weren't but about a handful of people showed up. And then the same at her burial. Cause nobody knew who her kinfolk was. Well, said the old man thought, well, maybe now I can finally get some peace. He was mighty wrong. Said one day in the spring, he was out cutting a few logs to build him a smokehouse. And said he kept losing his axe. Said everywhere he turned. Said every time he turned around, it'd be missing and be somewhere else. Said finally he got mad and started fussing about it. Said as soon as he did, said he started hearing a cackling above him. And said and he looked up. And said sitting up there in a tree looking down at him was Aunt Delphi laughing. It scared him half to death, and again, she just vanished. Well, not long after that, his daughter was down at the creek, washing clothes. See, when all of a sudden, all of her clothes in the water turned to crimson red. Well, she started screaming naturally, and said as soon as she did, 
She said a cackle fell across the water and slightly echoed through that little old holler. Well, back in them old days, and oftentimes you'll see maybe some old pictures or something like that, and in some parts of Appalachia it may still be going on. But a lot of folks would keep like an old picture that hold water and a little old bowl I keep, you know, use it to wash their face with. A lot of times they'd use it if they come in from the field or something, they'd wash their face and hands or something before supper or before they went to bed or something like that. We said one evening the old timer had come in from the field and his missus told him to wash up for supper. Well, he went there and washed his face and his neck and washed his hands and his arms and stuff like that. Well, he went and opened the back door up and turned around, grabbed that pan, going to throw the water out. So as soon as he did, so he threw the water and said as he was throwing the water out the back door, she appeared, and the water went right through her. So she didn't laugh that time. She just disappeared. I reckon that went on for some time after that. I reckon over time, as the years went by, the old house and the old barn was falling in, so they tore it down. And, you know, as places grow and things, they put a road by there. And right where the house and the barn was, it was a curve. Real sharp one, too, they say. But said a whole lot of folks didn't want to use that road. Said because when you got to Aunt Delphi's curve, said a lot of times she'd appear in the seat beside you and cackle. There's also many a report of folks saying that as they turned that curve or was in the cemetery where she was buried, said she'd also run out of the wood line running at your car, cackling and yanking on the door trying to get in. I reckon over time, that just faded too. A lot of folks thought maybe she was just mysterious or something like that, but they did say that when they went up there to check on her, and they went in there to find her, they said there was some sticks in there and tied in some really funny ways. She took an old piece of coal and drawed symbols and stuff on the wall. So there was old jars of stuff that they had no idea what on earth it was all over the place. So I'll leave that up to you. This old story here comes from a lady, her folks from West Virginia. And she remembered her great-grandmother telling it when she was little. Said that her daddy was a logger. And back in, he used old mules and horses and stuff to pull the logs out. Well, said one morning, he got up before the sun come up. Hitched his old horse up and went to work. He said he had a good distance to travel. That's why he left before sun up. He said he'd done it like, just like he had uh, hundreds of times before. Well, along the way, he said Dawn was just peeking over the ridge. So his old horse started acting funny. So he thought, what in the world? Well, said about that time, just up the road a piece, so he saw a man standing there. So he just standing there with his head down. 
didn't know what was going on with him, so so he didn't have a gun or nothing. Said all he had was an old pocket knife, so he rushed and grabbed it, you know, in case he was in trouble or something. Well, I said as he got a little closer, said he could just feel something weren't right. So as he got up a little closer, we could kindly make out what he would look like. So the man looked up, and half his head was gone. He said nothing gory, or bloody, or anything like that. Just like pieces of it had vanished. Or never did, never was able to materialize or something. He said he started to raise an arm and just vanished. Needless to say, he got his horse to run. He said he didn't even look back. He said having to go to work, said he thought about that for a long time after that every morning when he'd go off to work. But I reckon for the rest of his days, he never seen it again. Here's one that was recently shared with me, but all I can remember is that it was in Alabama in the 1930s. Said a couple had got married, had them young, and, well, I said they inherited a, an old house with some land from a distant relative. And said they was living in a little old beady shack, you know, which most folks did back in them days. Well, say when they got there, say a couple of the neighbors had seen them, you know, moving in, come to meet them, things like that, and told them, said that they had never met that relative that, that you know, they got the house from. It was just passed to the next of kin. That's just how things was done back then. Well, so the neighbors told them, said he was the older feller, said, but nobody liked him. Said he was mean. Said he was meaner than a snake in the grass. Said couldn't nobody get along with that man, no matter how hard they tried. And said he'd start trouble with the slightest chance he got. And said even the neighbors told him, said, well, he passed on, but he still guards that house. And said they told him, said, well, what do you mean? Said they told him, said, oh, a lot of people would ride by on their horses or where a lot of folks walk back in them days. Said they'd be walking by. Said see him staring out the windows or passing the windows or something like that. But, said they didn't put too awful much into that kind of stuff, so they just kind of ignored it. Well, after a week or so, they started hearing things. Little knocks and bangs, but just kind of shrugged it off as you know, the wood popping or the house settling and stuff. And then late at night, when everybody was in bed, they started hearing heavy boots walking through the house. After a while, the wife and young believed it, but the husband still refused. He didn't believe it. He always had some kind of explanation. That is, till one night, he got him sauced. I mean, he got him some shine. I mean, I mean, he got gassed and passed out in his chair. Well, the wife and the young one went off to bed, but was soon woke up by him screaming to the top of his lungs. So she told that young one to sit still, and so he jumped up, and she ran out to find him laying there screaming, crying and scared out of his wits. See, he wouldn't hardly say nothing or thing, but said she couldn't get out of his sight the rest of the night. Said he never did go back to sleep that night. Well, said the next day he got, got him up and started to pack. And started leaving to go back home. Well, finally on the way back, she asked him what it was he saw. He said, they were right. She said, what do you mean? He said, they were right. He said, he was 
Said he was laying there asleep. He said he was woke up by footsteps coming at him. Said he opened his eyes to an old man with no eyeballs. His scraggly hair leaned over him about an inch from his face and whispered, Get out of my house. Here's an old story that happened in my family here in middle Tennessee in an area called Cagle out toward Dunlap, Tennessee back in the 1970s. My grandparents had six kids, five daughters and a son. A long time ago, back when my mama was in her teens and all of them lived back at home and stuff, they lived in an old house. I always had a lot of ghostly activity. I mean, they still lived in it when I was born, when I was young, and I remember it very well. One of the biggest things that would happen was called the ghost car. Now there's something known as a residual haunting. That's where something happens on like a certain date or something like that every year or every month or something, you know, on a certain date. It's almost like a record plan, like a fingerprint in time. It happens, but it ain't aware of you. Well, it's every now and then. Well, they say it would happen every now and then just at random times. So they'd hear a car pull in. And so you hear the motor running, and then you hear it turn off. But no matter how hard you try, you wouldn't find it. He said many other people that would come by visiting, kin folks, friends, neighbors, they all heard it too a lot of times. Well, over time, it got to where it would pull in, and you could see headlights. So it would sit there a few seconds, cut the lights and the engine. As soon as the lights was off, it was gone. And after that, it would pull in, and you could see, uh, you'd see the headlights and the outline of a car. But not quite enough to make out what kind it was. Now, my Aunt Jenny, the youngest daughter, once saw the outline of a man sitting inside of it. She said he was a big and two. Big old feller. Well, they seen that for years and years and years, even till after I was born. Then Grandpa, they kept seeing it when everybody moved out and stuff. Well, then eventually they found that my house was in a little better shape and they moved and possibly, you know, I've often thought, Lord, the way it was building up, what was we going to do when that car pulled up and he got out and come in. Even hearing him saying that, just recalling it, would raise hair all over me and turn my spine to ice. Another time, my mama had the same house and everybody was outside. A hot summer day. People, everybody was sitting outside under the shade trees and things like that. And said my uncle, he was, you know, in his late teens, and he had him a car he was working on. Him and my, my pa. Well, my mom says she come in to get something to drink. Back then, most folks didn't have air conditioning or nothing like that. They just had their doors open and windows open. Well, it says she heard something in the kitchen, and knowing everybody was outside, went to look, see what it was. Well, it says she was walking into the kitchen and stopped in shock. Because there on the table was this thing sitting there on the edge of the kitchen table playing with Pa's coffee cup. It said it looked kind of like a mix of a, a monkey and a cat. It said it sat 
straight up like somebody. Had hairy little hands and a long tail, says she thought. Well, it's some kind of monkey till it turned and looked at her. And she just got this feeling that, no, it weren't of this world. Said its eyes looked funny. Said it spotted her. Took off out the back door. Said it shot out the back door and instantly shot to the right. Well, said she took off as soon as it did. Said as soon as it turned, it vanished. But you also got to know, I remember this place very good. And as soon as you went out that back door or the front door, either one, it was big open areas. It had a huge yard. It was surrounded by fields. A lot of folks over the years after I got up some age and got interested in Hanks and paranormal stuff like that, you know, a lot of folks that remembered that area, a lot of folks thinks that whole place was a portal. You know, back in the old days here in the Appalachia, they weren't a whole lot to do. Most folks had to just do what they could to entertain themselves. Play music or just get together and sit around jaw or something like that, you know, go visiting. Well, my grandpa said that back when he was a younger man, said that one thing they all like to do is go swimming. Well, so him and a bunch of his buddies got together once. A couple of his brothers, and they all went swimming. Now, back then, one of the ways folks made a living was mining. Folks worked in coal mines. Now, for some reason or another, God only knows why, but, uh, well, they dug a big old pit. Well, well not far from where they lived was an old coal mining camp. That went out of business. But that coal mining camp had dug a big old pit. And it filled up with water. It was like a big old pond like. Well, I said they used to go down there and go swimming in it. Well, I said that one day they was in there swimming. I said, I don't know. He said it was just odd. Oh, I said they just. All of us just kind of uneasy, like, you know, said just tension, you know. Said all of them kept looking over their shoulders and things, you know. Said oftentimes you kind of feel like you're being watched. Well, said they took their shirts off and their shoes and stuff and dove in. Well, after a few minutes and after a little bit of time, they... Tension started easing up, and they was having fun, things like that. And so they dragging, stacking up big old rocks and jumping off of it into the water and things like that, having a time. Well, one of them was able to open his eyes underwater. He said the water's fairly clear, you know. Well, I said that he took off and jumped in. Said so that boy come back up white as a ghost. More said he was more like he was fighting and swimming to the edge. He said he got out of there and said he was kicking. They was had trying to hold him down to find out what was going on. They thought of an old snake, an old water moccasin might have bit him or something. And said he all he would do is just shake his head and point to the water. Well, my, well. My pa's oldest brother, they called him E.J. They said this old, they said this man weren't afraid of nothing. They said he weren't afraid of Hanks, or nothing. Well, they said he took off and jumped in. They were trying to talk him out of it because they didn't know what he was. We well, said he jumped in, went under the water. They said he'd come back and everything. 
I told him, I said, get your clothes. Get your clothes on now. We got to go. I said, what is it? He said, don't you worry about it. He said, just get your clothes on. Let's go. Well, I said, they all grabbed their clothes and stuff and everything and hightailed it out of there. Well, when they got back to the house, I said, they asked him, said, E.J., what in the world was it? What what'd you say? You know, see, so just, you just need to stay away from there, all of us. And we need to stay away from that place. And we don't need to go back no more. Well, said one of them finally told him, said, if you don't tell us, we're going to go back right now. <coughs> you know. And see, he told him, said, all right, all right. Said, so he finally sat him down there and told him. And see, he told him, said, well, said, I dove in and swam down toward the bottom. He said, there's a man sitting down there looking up at me. Said, but he looked like he was half fish. Said, they just kind of looked at him, kind of like puzzled, confused. And said, at first they thought that he was Josh, you know, said, you know, pulling their leg, you know. He said, no, mm-mm. Said, said, that's the Lord's honest truth. And the other boy with him, Ernest, told him, said, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I saw. And said, it, it weren't like he was trying to hurt him or nothing. Said, he was just sitting there. Said, it looked like a man. Shaped like a man, but it kind of looked like a fish. Had qu fish qualities to it, too. And said it just sat there and was watching them. And said when he swam down the first time, said it just looked at him and turned its head. Said he scared him half to death. Said he about let out his breath right there and inhaled underwater. It scared him so bad. Well, E.J. told him, said, yep, said, that's exactly what I saw. He said, same thing. He said, didn't turn his head, said, but he was just sitting there watching me. He said, didn't know what it was. But now, after that, I reckon they said there was a lot of other people went down there and went swimming and stuff. But now, as far as I know, nobody else seen it. But now, that don't necessarily mean... They didn't go down toward the bottom, neither. It's almost kind of spooky, though. It almost run a chill up your spine. Sit there and think about sitting there swimming and something like that sitting up there just watching you. Next time you go swimming in an old creek bed or an old river or something like that, Stop and think. Just what might be down there watching you. There was once an old witch woman that lived back in the hills. Folks say she's well over a hundred years old. It was both feared and respected. Said she had an energy about her that nobody had ever felt before. <laughs> it weren't good nor bad, just different. Said she walked everywhere with two old dogs. Said wherever she was, there's always a mess of crows around a calling. Now, folks that had spoke to her said her name was Ivy May. They said she was known to just appear out of nowhere. Well, said one younger gal lived close by named Mary. But all the fellers wouldn't have nary a thing to do with her. Said they'd laugh at her and poke fun of her because she had a cleft lip. One day, a couple of gals was walking home from town saw Mary walking to her granny's. So they started laughing at her and making fun of her. Mary started crying. I said out of nowhere, Ivy May stood behind Mary with an angered look. Said them two gals started to run. 
But Ivy Mae froze them in their tracks. Said Ivy Mae leaned down, rubbed Mary on the head, said, don't you fret a bit, sweetheart. There'll never be nary another nasty thing past their lips. I said they took off running. I said that evening, one guy was kicked by an old mule, and the other one fell out of a wagon. Neither one of them was able to talk. Well, after some time had passed, they started getting made fun of, seeing what that was like. So they started being nice to people. Doing good things. We said as soon as they started doing that, their voice come back. And I reckon from then on out, they was good people. And as far as Mary, well, they said she woke up one morning with a normal lip. Said all the fellas around town was crazy about her. Said all of them went on about her, asking to take her to dances and shindigs and things like that. Said she wouldn't give them the time of day. Said she'd just flip her hair and keep on a walking. Reagan said she eventually wound up marrying a lawyer. Said time to time she'd pass a wifey me. Mary would always smile and wave. Said so she'd always look at Mary with a grin and a wink. I was sitting here reminiscing, I was thinking about an old memory. About an old house across the creek that nobody wanted had nothing to do with. Because it was owned by a witch. And some thought it was cursed. See, back where I grew up, there weren't nothing but mountains. Just old folks, and, you know, just things like that. A lot of the old timers are still around, still know the whole lot of the history around them mountains and stuff, them old hills and hollers. And there was naturally trails and stuff everywhere. Even though back when I was growing up, there was roads and things, but there was still a whole lot of old paths that people still use from time to time. But nevertheless, there was one old house across the creek. I see where we live, we all lived on one side of the creek. Now, if you crossed that creek, you went back in there to where they used to log and stuff like that and everything. But if you kept going, and you went way back in there, you come up on an old field, big old field. And there's a house sitting at the edge of it. It weren't a big house, it weren't a really small house. But everybody said to stay away from it. Said that a witch woman lived there a long time ago. Now the house itself was old as dirt. I mean, mighty old. Funny thing was, it was in real good shape, but nobody took care of it. And the field always looked like it was freshly cut, but nobody ever, ever cut it. Nobody bush hogged it or nothing, because you couldn't get a bush hog back to it. The only way to get to it was a little old footpath. About a foot, foot and a half wide. Something like that. I remember we walked back there once. Me and my dad. Mom and everything. And like I said, it weren't uncommon for folks to go to it. Uh, but like I said, most folks stayed away from it. A lot of the old timers said that there was a witch that was buried somewhere on the property. Said she had some of her kin come in. That was also a witch and buried her. Said she had a diamond on her finger. 
so big you couldn't reach around it. Said nobody knows where exactly she was buried. Some folks think it was under the house. Well, anyway, we went back there one time. Hot during the summer, things like that. We just out for a walk. Well, we went by there and we went inside. I'm trying to tell Dad not to. You know. Well, he wanted to anyhow. Well, we went in. And let me tell you, just the minute that place come into view, you just got these feelings that just run all over you from head to toe. So I'm telling you, just stay away. Well, we went in. There were still pictures hanging on the walls. Old tin types. Things like that. Old pictures. The funny thing was, I, well, after we got in there, Dad got to look around. Like she said, like I said, there was still pictures and furniture and stuff everywhere. Well, Dad rested over, and it, it, it almost looked like them people. It almost, it was almost like their eyes would follow you, or they was just staring at you, looking into your soul. Dad rushed up there, took one of the pictures off the wall. Me and Mama both tell him, don't do that, don't do that. Well, he done it anyway. Well, before as he walked through the doorway, they weren't even a door on it. Uh, yeah, they weren't no door on it. Uh, as soon as Dad walked through the doorway, Mama hollered at him. He looked down, and his hand was a dripping blood. That picture, the glass had shattered and cut him. And I mean, it cut him good, boy. He was bleeding like a stuck hog. Well, he said, I'm going to take this picture back and show it to my grandpa. You know, and back in when I was real pretty little, his pa, his uh, grandpa was still alive. He said, see if he knows any of these people. Well, anyhow, he took it. He took it home with everybody trying to tell him, take that picture back, leave it be, take that picture back. Oh, no, he weren't having none of it. He was taking that to his pa let him see it. Well, he did. And I said, funny thing was, he showed it to his pa and a lot of the old timers down there on the creek. They weren't nary a one of them know to any of them people. So it must have been some hurricane from somewhere else. Well, instead of taking it straight back, he took it back to the house. And for weeks after that, Lord, anything that could possibly go wrong did. And finally one day, Mom finally brought in and told him, said, get that picture back over yonder now. He said, oh, well, maybe you hear it there too. She said, now. Well, he listened. He said, you take that back over there. You hang that back up exactly where it was, just like how you got it. And you apologize. Well, he went back over there and hung it up and apologized. And then things went back to normal. And I remember one old fella said that he was going hunting. He said he had to cross that field to get to his hunting spot he was talking about. He could have went the other way, but that way was a, a, a lot shorter, so he went and going to cut across the field. He said it was just getting breaking daylight. He said he walking up that old path, that old field, and that old house, and he eased into view. And he said there was this white mist-like stuff. He said it was walking across the field. And he said, funny thing was, he said it was shaped like a person, but it weren't. It was just a, like a white mist. And said and it was, legs was moving like it was walking. But it was going faster like it was running. He said, weirdest thing I'd ever seen. He said, I just stopped and watched. And said, and it stopped. And then turned, looked at him. Turned back around. And walked down into the ground. Dad asked him, said, what'd you do? He said, well, what do you think I did? I turned around and I went back to the house. <laughs> he said, I didn't go hunting that day. Next time I went, he said, I went the long way around. 
I said a lot of old timers swore up and down said that place was cursed. I ain't been back there in many, many, many years. I don't even know if the house is still there or not. I don't know if somebody bought it and tore it down or I I don't know. Hey folks. Thanks for coming in and seeing me again. It's mighty good to see you. I recently had an old Hank story shared with me. I want to share with you because it's probably one of, one of the scariest things I've heard in a long time. Long time ago, way back in the hills of Virginia, in the 1800s, it was a real close-knit community, as most of us back in. Because back in, like I said, folks just looked out for one another. Well, every Sunday, there's a church, or they go to the prayer meetings. They all love to sing it around, sing them old hymns and things like that. And they said that the old preacher man was old as dirt. They said the poor old fella was so old. But some said the good Lord made him and then built the world around him. Anyway, he said he'd often go around and check on folks. Well, one day, a woman showed up out of nowhere. Said she tried being friendly with folks, but and said she talked with a funny accent. So being an outsider, folks didn't take too kindly to her. So they just kindly give her the cold shoulder. Well, said one old widow woman, she was nice to her. Said her name was Elizabeth. It says she was from a faraway land and had a whole lot of sisters. Well, I reckon she tried over and over and over to make friends and be nice to people and things like that. But they just shut their doors in her face, told her to leave, and just you know, snarl their nose up at her and things like that. Well, she thought, I'll try talking to the old preacher man. One Sunday, she got up, put on a real nice dress, and got all dudded up, and started seeing folks walking down the path and going to preaching. Well, it says she waited just a little bit, then ease down the path. She wanted to talk to the old preacher in front of everybody. Cause she thought, well, if I speak to him, then he'd speak to her. And then maybe other folks would start coming around. Well, it says she was mighty excited to make some new friends. Said as she got closer, she heard talking. Then her little old church come into view. There they all was. Out of talking to each other. An old preacher right there in the middle of them. Well, I said she put on her best smile and started walking towards them. Said they saw her. Started whispering, pointing, and things like that. Said soon as she said hi to the old preacher, said all of them started to sing just to drown her out. Said she thought, well, okay, I can play that game too. So she started talking a mite louder. Said the old preacher stopped everybody, sort of hushed them down a little. Said she thought, well, finally. She looked over at her said, hold your tongue, witch. Say, ain't nobody here wants to hear you evil blasphemous mouth. Now get on. Well, said, that just broke her heart. 
So she started crying, turned around. And she started to walk off. Some of them started singing again. Some of them started to snicker and laughing. Says she stopped right there in the middle of the road. Turned around, waved her arms, and said, So, oh, I hope you guys enjoy one another and you singing. Because that's about to be all you got. Says she gave him a crooked smile and left. Well, after that, Reckon she went, packed up her stuff, and moved. Nobody seen her again. Well, around the early 1900s, a couple of fellers, who was also brothers, was walking across the mountains, going to see some of their kinfolk. So back in, a lot of folks traveled by foot. Uh, a lot of times they'd have to travel a mighty long ways. Well, I reckon it was getting late, so he decided to stop and make him a fire, set up a camp, set out again, first light. Well, it's way up in the night, one of them got woke up by what sounded like a talking off in the distance. And said he woke the other one up, so they got to listening and decided to investigate. Said they peeped over a big old rock and saw a slight glow of light coming out of an old abandoned run-down church. Said one of them went a-sneaking off down towards it, hiding behind rocks here and there and dodging trees and things. Said he creeped up to the window eased up and peeped in and said he just stood there looking for a while well, said this whole time said his brother was up there on the ridge watching him and said while he was standing there watching him all of a sudden he started hearing singing well, I said about one old boy cut loose and running and they said he run so fast. They said he was running into trees, bouncing off of them, tripping over rocks. And good Lord said he fell all over the place, but never did hit the ground. He was moving so fast. Well, I said also as he ran off, the light slowly dimmed out. And the singing died down and stopped. Said he passed his brother and just kept a running. His brother, the one that was a watching, so he had to pick up everything around the camp there, their belongings, their little knapsacks, their blankets, whatever they had there. Say, because his brother never did stop. Say, he just kept on running. Well, say, finally, he seen him on their kinfolk's porch. Say, he had a big old white patch of hair on his head. He asked him, said, what in the world happened? See, his brother looked up at him, eyes as big as a silver dollar. And so he started stuttering and said, Lord, I went up that winter and peeped in. And there they was, having church. See, his brother said, well, so? He said, so? No, you don't understand. They were dead. Said instantly, he said, his brother got a cold chill run up his spine. He said, dead? He said, yes, sir, dead. Said, froze in my tracks. He said, stood there for a minute because he couldn't move. And then, they all stopped. And they turned and looked at me. He said, when they all spotted me, they commenced to sing in them hymns. Well, needless to say, I reckon, whenever they went back home, they took a different way back. Yeah. For the rest of his life, they said that one old boy stuttered for the rest of his days. And had that white patch of hair until the rest of it caught up when he got old. Now, whether this lady was a 
witch or into some other kind of magic. I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. A long time ago, back here in these old hills of Appalachia, folks were strong, independent, and brave. One old feller was awful known for his bravery. They said he weren't afraid of no man, beast, nor haint. And that was put Riley to the test. See, whenever folks has a reputation for just about anything, others will surely put that to the test. This old feller, old EJ, he was a good old feller, they said. Mighty good. But he had a high reputation of not being scared of nothing at all. Said he'd stand up to any man that walked, tame a wild horse, Said he'd walk through the hills with nary a thing to protect himself from an old painter or bears or anything without so much as a worry, a twitch, or a bead of sweat. Said folks told the places to stay clear of cause of, cause of them being hainted and stuff, but said they never stopped old EJ. They said he'd strut right up to them places. Said he never went looking for things like that, but never avoided it neither. They said old E.J. weren't a real big feller neither, just an average size. They just weren't scared of nothing. Well, I reckon one day one of his kin named Herschel come up to him and said, E.J., I heard about something that'll sure far put you to the test. So E.J. just looked at him, grinned, and shook his head. So he looked at him and said, what's the point in it, Herschel? So Herschel said, I'm bound and determined to find something that'll scare you. So EJ just laughed and said, Well, what you got in mind? So old Herschel grinned and said, Well, I heard an old timer a talking about a witch. Said that he overheard talking to a feller about going to a certain tree three mornings in a row. And something happened to that feller that turned his hair plum white. Said, now I bet you a fifty cent piece you won't do that. And for a long time, old E.J. just laughed it off. Well, one evening after supper, they was all sitting around, sitting on the porch, and the sky started getting mighty dark. So old thunderheads rolled in, lightning was splashing across the sky, and thunder was doing that old low, spooky rumble. Well, old E.J. started thinking about what old Herschel had said. About that time, the wind started picking up. And it started a howling, a whistling thing. Well, everybody else got up and went inside. But old E.J., not being scared of anything, just sat there in his rocking chair studying. And not wanting to scare his mom and pa or anybody else, he went back in acting like he was going to turn in for the night. But instead, he put on his old hat and snuck out his window headed out, going up the ridge to see the old witch woman. Not to prove that he weren't scared, but just out of curiosity. I said he walked through them old woods with that old storm making them mighty oaks bend like switches. I said it weren't long till the old witch woman's cabin come into view with a single light on. The lightning was a lighting the area up like the sun when he moseyed up on the porch. The old woman yanked the door open, looked out with her glass blue blind eyes and said, Get in here before you get blowed away. Said he walked in and took his hat off and said, Ma'am, uh, and she held her hand up and said, I know why you're here. Said she leaned back and said, why you want to go poking about with something you don't know nary a thing about? She said, oh, just curious, I reckon. She said, I tell you what, 
you study on that a mite. And if you're still curious by the next full moon, well, you just come on back and I'll tell you. I said he thanked her. He said she laughed. And he said, ma'am? She said, don't thank me, boy. Because you don't have the foggiest notion what you thinking me for. He said, oh, I ain't scared of no haint. She said she eased forward in her chair and said, ain't no haint. So he made big old eyes and grabbed his hat and nodded and just got up and left. Said he kept playing what she said over and over in his head all the way home. Said the next morning he got up and was studying on it too. Said he thought it's four days till the next full moon. So he had a long thinking spell. And on the fourth night, he went back. Says she was sitting there on her porch waiting for him. Says she was sitting there rocking. Told him to set a spell. Said, So you studying on that, ain't you, boy? He said, Yes, am She said, If you do this, ain't no sorry gonna help you. He said, well, I really don't know what it is we're talking about. Said she started laughing and said, No, no, you sure don't. Said he laughed and said, Well, what's worse than old Hank? Said she cackled a little bit and said in almost a whisper, The old devil himself. <laughs> she leaned her head back, took a big old deep breath and said, there's a tree in Wafer's Holler, older than all the rest, and bigger. So he told her, said, yes, I'm, I know the one you're talking of. She said, you go to that tree just before daylight, and told him what to say. Now, when I collected this old story, I was told the exact type of tree, and what was to be said and everything, but I ain't going to repeat it. Cause I was promised to keep it secret, and not only that, I wouldn't say it on here because I don't want nobody else to try it. But anyhow, she told him the words. He said, now you got to do that three mornings in a row, just before daylight. And on the third morning, he'll be there. Well, I said they talked a little longer, and said then he left for home. And he told Herschel what he had to do. He said he tried talking E.J. out of it. So he told him, he said, no, he said, man, that ain't no Hank. That ain't just nothing regular scary right there. He said, that, that, you, just, that, st you just stay away from it. He said, oh, E.J. said, no, nah, he was bound and determined. Well, I said the first morning he went up there. He said he walked to that old tree. He said the incantation. And said a cold presence circled him. Said the second morning. Said he went to it. Said the incantation. Said whispers began to come forth from the tree trunk. And said that night he began to have cold feet. Said he started thinking about that a lot. But said he thought, well, I ain't scared, but ain't nobody want to see the old devil, but. As the night went on, he thought, well, if and I don't, I'll be known as a chicken, be known as yeller. I ain't doing that. He said, not to mention Herschel, no backs. I reckon he stayed with him that night. So on the third morning, he woke Herschel up and took off with his lantern. Well, after a spell, Herschel seen old E.J. coming back across the field. Said he seemed off just a touch. Said he just seemed to stare off into nothing. Said he asked E.J. Said, well, how'd he go? What happened? Said old E.J. Said well, the old devil didn't show up, but one of his helpers did. Just strolled on up onto the porch and sat down and started whittling. And Herschel said, well, 
what it looked like. Said so EJ glanced up, pointed with the stick he was a willing on. Said, see for yourself, it followed me. So Herschel's blood turned to pure ice. Said he eased around, and yeah, there in the tree line, there it stood. Said it was kind of like a man, but with long, dark, grungy hair almost down to its ankles. Said you couldn't make out any details other than its piercing orange eyes. Said it turned its head and cocked its head to the side like a bird would. Said Herschel screamed and run like a scalded dog. I reckon for weeks after that, it followed him just about everywhere he went. Said he couldn't rest, couldn't sleep. Started hearing voices. Nightmares, Lord, they said he had nightmares. Night terrors, sweat. They started seeing things and everything. See, he couldn't come inside his ma's house or anywhere that was religious. And said a lot of folks reported seeing that thing following him too. Said a lot of folks also said to have had night horrors and things like that and bad luck. Where some said to have health problems, eyesight problems and things like that, just for even glancing at it. Said one day his ma said, EJ, you gotta get shed of that thing. He said, Mama, I don't know how. Said she rushed over and grabbed him by the shirt, pulled him to the door and said, you get down to the church and you get down there now. Well, said he took off. Said outside the church, the old preacher grabbed him, yanked him inside and down on his knees and started praying. So all the while, that thing was a running around outside, making circles around the church and making noises like an injured pig. Said the preacher kept him there for a couple of days, praying and praying and praying. And said soon it started being seen less and less. I reckon after a long time it finally stopped. One day he said he saw the old witch along the path as he was walking to the prayer meeting. Said she asked him if it went to his liking. Said he said, Lord, I'd like to have never got shed of that thing. Said again, she lightly cackled and said, What do you mean, rid of? You conjured that thing up, boy. Is it just cause you can't see it? Don't mean it ain't there. Said so folks said he never said nary a word about ever seeing it again. But even when old E.J. passed, folks studied on it a mite and then wondered if it really was gone or if it was just a waiting. Here in the Appalachia, there's stories that's been lost to the whispers of time. Some old story still travels on this old wind. And some of them, some of them will chill you to the bone. I was recently talking to an old feller. He was talking about old stories and things. And he told me a story that run chills up my spine. I want to share it with you. He said his great granddaddy was from the hills of Kentucky. He said he was known all throughout them bridges, hollers and things like that, for trapping, hunting, tracking, things like that. He said folks come from miles around just to hire him for his skills. Well, let's see, one day he rode his horse go look for some new, better hunting areas. Said he ended up in an old holler. And said it was getting mighty late, so he decided to just make camp till morning. Said it was warm, beautiful area. Said he even thought about fishing in the old creek that was running alongside him there the next morning for about to eat. Well, I said he had him a nice far going, kick back, and watching the stars and things, and the moon was shining bright in the sky. And when his horse started acting up, 
Well, being from the hills, he knowed something weren't right. Said his first thought was old coyotes, wolves, and just a wild animal of some kind. Said, so he went over to his saddle and got his repeater. He kept a weary eye open for a spell. So after a while, he fell asleep. Then he suddenly got woke up to his horse a-pawing at the ground and a-snorting. Said he opened his eyes to an old woman, sort of hovering over him, nose to nose. Said he froze in fear. He couldn't utter a single word, but tears just poured. Said her skin was like dried mud. She had sunk in eyes that seemed to just stare through him rather than at him. Said all he could do is just sit there and stare. Said he later recalled that the whole time he couldn't remember hearing any noise of any kind coming from any direction. He said it was almost as if the world just kind of stopped and him and her was the only thing that existed. Said he wanted to move, scream, run so bad he couldn't stand it. Man, it said it was like his body was just paralyzed. And it says she opened her mouth wider and wider. And her jaws just seemed to kind of unhinge going from side to side. And it says she let out a shriek that just echoed through that holler. It said, Lord, it hurt his ears. It said it was so loud and hurt so bad that he remembered feeling something around his ears. And he later found out it was blood. She had screamed so loud it made his ears bleed. And then just like that, she was gone. Said he laid there for a few more minutes, he's still in shock. He scared him so bad he didn't even know what to do. Said he jumped up, looking around in panic and just sheer horror. Saddled up his horse and got on it and rode for dear life. Well, I said several months that went by, and he eventually got a few fellers together and rode back to the area. Cause he kept having nightmares about it over and over and over. Said he just could not get a wink of sleep. Well, said when they got back, said that the rocks he used for his far was still there, and still in the same exact shape and everything. Said he began to get a chill. Said every one of them did. And they all become uneasy when they saw Signs of witchcraft all in the trees in the area. Said one feller, said he, said, you must have upset something or it just didn't want you here. Or something. Said, because it was late when he rode in and didn't see the carvings. Said the old feller got down off his horse and got to looking around. So they said something had to have been drawing him back there. He said they told him to look high and low, and that they did, all the way down even to the creek down there, looking around. So there was carvings in the trees, and the markings, and sticks tied together in certain ways, and things like that, just all kinds of stuff. Well, like I said, one old fella got down, and he was to looking around, and he got to noticing Said he spotted something kindly odd sticking out from under one of the rocks they had used for his campfire. Well, after they'd done a little bit of digging and got to looking, he realized it was a bone. And then he stood up and his blood turned to pure ice because he realized he had built his fire on top of her bones. Well, said he removed the rocks and took them back down to the creek went out of the area and got some fresh dirt and come back over and 
sprinkle put dirt back up over the area and patted it down real nice and just apologized over and over and over. Said, Lord, please forgive me. I didn't mean to disturb you. Rest. I didn't mean to. I had no idea. Lord, I am so, so sorry. And then after that, that's all he know to do. That's all, all he could really think of to do. So he just had to hope for the best. I well, said so they saddled up, and turned around, and rode for home. And so as far as anybody knew, they reckoned the nightmare stopped. You know, way back in these old mountains, ridges, hollers, there's one thing I can say about these old Appalachian mountain witches. They stay true to their word, even after death. Years ago, there's this old farm woman named Minnie Van Sickle. Everybody said was a witch. She lived on a curve in the road in a run-down old farmhouse. They had two barns and a shed on her property. I remember riding down the road at night with my folks when I was just a young as the car would approach the bend in the road where she lived there, the headlights would illuminate her front porch. And sometimes, she'd be sitting on the porch glaring at us as we went around the bend. I once asked my great aunt Jane about her, and she bluntly replied, She's a witch. Another time, I asked an old farm with her, lived in her neighborhood about her. This woman was a highly Christian woman. And when I asked her if Minnie was a witch, she hesitated and replied, Well, she's done some strange things. And that's all she said. Now, her land was once farmed by her husband. But before he died, he sold off all the farm ground to a man named Nicholson. But he kept the house and the barns and about six acres of the land. Nicholson was one of them fellers who had a lot of money and bought up land to eventually develop into houses. However, he never moves fast sometimes it's years before he does anything with the ground he buys. For instance, I used to squirrel hunt on his land, and today there's a big old fancy home right there where I used to sit and shoot old gray squirrels. Well, apparently, even though Minnie no longer owned her farm ground, she would still try to run people off of it. I've heard men talk of being back there in the woods early of the morning, waiting on the squirrels to start moving. When almost as, as if she come out of nowhere, Minnie would be standing there glaring at them and pointing with a bony finger. Get off my land. Nicholson tried talking to her, but it didn't do no good. She continued to harass hunters and root diggers right up till she died. She told Nicholson, You'll never get to use my land for anything, Jim Nicholson. I'll see to it. When Minnie died, somebody burned down her house. And later on, somebody come and burned down her barns and sheds. And nothing's left but a crumbling old spring house down the slopes from her home. When she died, having no heirs or anything, her six acres come up on tax sale, and a man named Doherty bought it. And to this day, has done nothing with that property.
So in the years after Minnie's death, her former farm began to spring up pockets of marshy ground. Nobody had an explanation for it. But year after year, the ground became more swampy and worthless for anything but hunting. Then over the years, it even became too difficult to hunt in. Here and there in the growing swamp, you can find a deer stand that now sits out in the water, still attached to a tree. The place is now just a home for muskrats, coons, bobcats, and stuff. Now, being a trapper, I asked Nicholson for permission to trap on it, which he granted. He just gave me a warning to watch out for sinkholes and quicksand. The first year I trapped it, I did pretty good. But he was right about them sinkholes. I once found a muskrat lodge built over what looked like a deep sinkhole. So I cut a pole and run it down in the water. I went down at least eight foot. Couldn't touch bottom. Twice I broke through the surface sunk up over my knees and was lucky both times to have a partner trapping with me. But one of the creepiest things was finding fence posts sticking up out of the swamp with the fence wire still stapled to it. That old land sure did have a gloomy air to it and it still does. What made me finally quit trapping the place weren't the lack of critters nor the swampy ground. It was the handprints. One morning I was headed back to the swamp to check my traps and I noticed a white handprint on a tree right where I went in. More than that, as I followed my line, I began to notice more handprints on more trees. Now I didn't touch them but seemed to be made of some sort of powder or something. And this kept going on, and I ain't gonna lie to you, it spooked me. I figured somebody was watching me. So one morning, I got the idea, and I entered the swamp at a point where I'd never gone into it before. The next morning, there was white handprints on the trees. Well, that right there was quite enough for me. Well, I quit trapping there, and I won't enter the place anymore. I took some photos from around the place, but I'll never set foot in that swamp near again. Old Nicholson's gone now, and his son owns the grounds says it's a worthless piece of property. It has been classified as a wetland, so it can never be used for anything except from waterfowl and the critters that live in it. And just maybe, just maybe, the spirit of an old witch who to this day won't let nobody use her land. Throughout these ancient mountains of Appalachia, over the centuries, there's been many kind of magic flow through these old hills. Witches, granny magic, and even voodoo. Back in mid-1873, it was a lady in my family 
that lived back in the hills of North Carolina, just across the Tennessee line. Her name was Elizabeth. Lovely, beautiful lady. Well-to-do local feller, but a politician wanted to marry her. But Elizabeth didn't like him like that. And he was one of them that thought he could have and get anything he wanted just because he had money and his political stature. Well, after turning him down at a social event, and, as he said, causing lots of embarrassment, started causing her lots of trouble. Back then, folks were dirt poor and do just about anything to make a dollar. Shoot, some of them would do anything and did. Said the politician got folks to humiliate her publicly and just all kinds of mean, nasty things. Said they even burned down her house. So with no home, friends, she found herself standing on a cliff face about to leap when she heard a voice a soft yet stern voice of a lady say what you doing child she turned around to see a lady standing there in a beautiful dress and a head wrap she explained what was happening and the lady introduced herself as Marie, a lady from Louisiana who was there visiting, checking on a dear friend of hers. Marie asked Elizabeth to join her back in Louisiana. Glad to have finally had a little bit of kindness and nowhere else to go, she graciously accepted. I reckon Marie took Elizabeth in guided her with teachings and stuff. Several years later, Elizabeth returned to her once home after the death of her friend and mentor Marie. Only this time, she walked with confidence. Folks remembered her and invited her to a wedding. She was having a mighty good time when that old politician saw her started laughing he says well never thought we'd see your face around here again she smiled and said looks like you misjudged a whole lot of stuff mr politician a whole lot of stuff said he smiled as left him and he walked off that night he wanted some fellers to repeat what they did last time said it all started as they was having a meeting. Said as they was planning it out, sitting there. Old politician had all them fellers in there and stuff. The lamps and candles kept blowing out. But there weren't no wind. As them fellers was a sneaking up to her house, said her feet become like lead. One of them even reported said, Boys, my legs like rigor mortis. Says about that time, Elizabeth walked out on the porch and called out each one of them's name. And said, if I see any one of you anywhere near me or trying anything like this to anybody else, said, I'll hank your dreams and bring a swarm of locusts down over your crops. Said they froze in fear. Said she snapped her fingers, and they run off, agreeing to leave her alone. Well, naturally, they run back, telling the old politician, and after telling him the news, said he laughed. That is, until that night. That night, he was awoken by what sounded like a whole mess of people talking, laughing, carrying on, and everything. Well, said he opened his eyes, and he was in a barn at a to-do. 
Oh, said people was a dancing around, a laughing and cutting up and going on. And he's so confused as he's still in his night clothes. That's the way he tries talking to people, asking where he's at and how he got there. So all they do is just look at him and laugh. No matter what he tries, they just laugh at him. He begs them and begs them, pleads with them and everything. But they just simply laugh at him. They say he's just drenched with humiliation and embarrassment. So then, they all turn mad, looking all mean, and they start screaming at him. So he looks up and sees Elizabeth standing in a corner with a glare and a crooked grin. So they start surrounding him, closing in on him. Said he's screaming, hollering, fighting for his life. And then he wakes up. And he sighs. Till he sees Elizabeth standing in the corner. He sat up in the bed, pushed himself back to the headboard. Big old wide eyes. So when his eyes adjusted, he could see she weren't alone. Said she was there whispering to another lady he had never seen before. An older light lady in a pretty dress and a head wrap. And said they're just staring at him. Elizabeth finally says, If and you ever treat anybody, I mean anybody, especially a lady like you have me, Mr. Politician. This is just a sample of what's to come your way. Said he begged and pleaded and begged and pleaded and promised the moon. And she says, Oh, I believe you, but you still got to pay for your wicked deeds. Said her and that other lady, started laughing and vanished into the shadows of the room. So the next day, the politician lost his job. It weren't long after that, he lost his home. So his dear friends, his closest friends, turned against him, turned their backs on him. And soon he became the local drunk. Said so everywhere he went, people would point and laugh, especially Elizabeth. And said on more than one occasion, he was reported her walking through town, or through a field, or down the road, and for a split second, folks would see her walking with another lady in a dress and her head wrap. But when they took a second look, it was just Elizabeth. Long time ago, way back in the 1930s, there was two elder widow women, the Baker sisters. Now the Baker sisters lived up on a ridge folks called Buzzard Ridge. Now, my great pa had always heard rumor and tales that them old women was witches. Now, mind you, from what he had heard, old Mara and Bertha Baker weren't the kind you wanted to go to for a poultice or seed ward or nothing like that. No. But rumors being rumors, and knowing how people talk, said he never put too much stock in it. Be honest with you. He said more than once that he kindly felt sorry for him, being up there all alone, nobody to talk to but one another. Why, being lonely gets you lost in your own mind, and that's a 
Mighty bad place to get lost in sometimes. Well, one day, that got to playing on his mind. And he thought, well, I'll just go up there, give him a visit, see for myself. It's the biggest mistake he'd ever made in his life. Said he went up that ridge and said the place just seemed well, like you had eyes on you like the whole time. And the feeling of turn and run stayed with him. Said he come up on the old cabin. Said there they was, sitting under a shade tree. Said one was a breaking beans, and the other was a scraping taters. Said, oh, they was just talking up a storm. And it just stopped. And slowly looked up at him. Said he hard, Howdy! Nice day, ain't it? They didn't say nothing. But they did give him an unsettling grin. Said one of them said, Howdy! In a real shaky voice. Said so Dudden kindly looked at him side eyed and said, What's your business here, boy? But he said, Sorry, I hope I ain't disturbing you, ladies. Said, I just had an extra mess of squash and doctors might like some of them. Said so one of them was a tiny little old beady bird of a lady. Said so she looked at him and said, Why, yeah, we do. Said so he walked over her. Still having that unsettling feeling. Said they sit and talked a spell. And the older one was Mara. Says Mara asked him if he'd like to stay for supper. And said he agreed. Well, said they told him to rest on the porch a little bit. Right there in the rocking chair. Get back and take a load off. And they prepare supper. Said they didn't get visitors much. Well, I said that struck him might odd, but see, he didn't think too awful much of it. Figured they just weren't used to having company or a, you know, a man person around. And not knowing him real good. He might, he thought they might have just been a little nervous. Well, I said he sat there in that old rocking chair and he dozed off. I said he come to with an old bearded man sitting in the chair beside of him leaned over about an inch from his face and Heidi said he jumped and leaned back and said Heidi rubbing his eyes and kind of get his eyes focused said when he did said he noticed the old feller was joined by about ten people standing around out in the yard just all over the place. Just in there grinning. Said he stood up. The old fella was trying to get him to sit back down. Almost to the point where he had trying to push him back into the rocking chair. Said as soon as he done that. Said them other ten. Started closing in. Well, said he was sitting there kind of like slapping that old feller and trying to get away from him. Said about that time he heard old Mary and Bertha yelling, Sit your hind end down, boy. Said he jumped up and run off the side of the porch just as hard as he could go through the yard into the woods. Said he could hear them chasing him and yelling for him to come back. Said he run as hard as he could, as fast as he could. Said he run till he got sick. Said he finally made it to the nearest home. And felt a little better. Yeah, said he felt a little better knowing he was back around in some type of civilization. Folks sitting out on the porch. Folks sitting out on the porch and stuff. 
and say well, when he got home, there's a burlap sack on his porch. So for the longest time, he just stood there looking at it. So he finally worked up enough courage to ease up our to it. So he took a big old stick, opened the end of it up there. See, it was the squash he took. See, so he took off and run to the preacher as hard as he could go. See, when he got there, he was telling the old preacher about it. Tell him about what happened. So the old preacher said, Boy, ain't people told you to stay away from there? He said, Yes, sir, yes, sir. But he said, I, I just kind of felt sorry for him. I didn't know, so I thought it was just old rumors. So he said, No, I'm afraid not. Well, said after that, said he never missed a chance to go to preaching, nor to a prayer meeting. And eventually, he became a preacher himself. This story was submitted by Thelma Clark. She said, back when I was a young in the mountains of good old beautiful Kentucky, she said, probably around 12 or so, said, my great granny Bill was still alive. We said, one night it come up a big old storm, boy. Lightning flashing, thunder and jarring the ground, the winders. We said, she looked out the window, eased back in her old rocking chair, started rocking again. Said, you could almost see a memory playing in her eyes. She sat there a second and looked over at us and said, she said, you know, there used to be an old witch and an old wizard in these parts. But funny thing was, nobody'd see him till it stormed. I said back when she was young, I said the whole family lived down in a little old holler down by the creek. I said there's an old witch woman. I said nobody knowed her name. Said for the most part, nobody talked to her. Said not necessarily because folks didn't want to talk to her, but said she made it right clear like she didn't have no interest in talking to nobody. But said it never failed though. Said as soon as it come up a big old storm or something, that some of the kinfolk would see her. Said she'd always meet up with what they called the old wizard man. They said they'd take to walking around, holding their hands up in the air and swinging them back and forth and things. They said folks thought it was kind of odd, but said they never said nothing. So well, some of the distant kin from the city come for a visit. Cousin Jeb said, but we all called him City. Because he moved out of the hills for some fancy learning. She said the day he got there, they said they had a big old time and stuff. Said they cooked him up a big old supper and said all the kinfolk was together and having a good old time. Said that evening, still daylight, they come up a big old storm. Said sure enough, said, here come the old witch woman out of the path, right there at the wood's edge. Said then the old wizard man come down the tree line. Said the city slicker asked him, said, what in the world are they doing out in the storm? I said, they told him, said, oh, that's the old witch woman, the wizard man. I said, they do that from time to time. She said, now keep in mind, we was all inside. I said, old city commenced to laughing, making fun of them, acting like they was doing stuff. I said, when he did, I said, they both stopped and turned and looked right directly at him from across the field. Now, us old hill folk, we backed way away from him when he done that. And he said, you dumb old hill folk, since he ain't nothing to that stuff. Well, so after that happened, said so they turned and went down the old path to her cabin. 
So that night, come a great big old storm. Lightning and flashing, things like that. Old thunder is to booming. Well, that old city started screaming top of his lungs right there in the living room. Said they all got up and seen Karen down the floor with a quilt over his head. She said her pa got up and yanked that off his head and said his hair had a big old white patch in it. Said his eyes was big as a silver dollar. Said after they calmed him down, he said he was laying there asleep. Said when the storm woke him up. Said no witch, no wizard was in the windows. Said lightning was a flashing, one right after another. And every time it'd flash, they'd be in a different winter. Said they started laughing at him. Said then Haints commenced crawling out of the pictures on the walls and out of the fireplace and crawling at him. Said then with a single flash, them and all the Haints was gone. See, the funny thing is, so was the storm. They said old city told him, said he started praying. She said, Pa told him, said, yeah, boy, it's mighty good to pray, especially when something like that happens. Said, but something else to keep in mind. Whenever you see something like that and you ain't got a horse in that race, best hash you up. This one comes from Darla Braden Miller. She says, Hi, Mr. Jared. Absolutely love the programs. You are my most favorite storyteller. So I'm originally from Georgia. And heard a story that was passed down through my family all my life. It's a story about some of my ancestors, a witch. And some Civil War soldiers. So what makes it interesting is about 10 years ago, my brother come across a Confederate Civil War journal with an entry that backed that story up. And back during the Civil War, times was mighty hard on everybody. Especially when the soldiers would come in and raid farms and stuff for their livestock and crops. So we're well, on the upper side of Georgia, a small family, the Millers, who lived down in a little old holler. Man, woman, two youngins, a little boy and a gal. Well, just above them up there on the ridge was an old witch woman. Kind of tall and kind of heavy set kind of lady. She stayed off to herself mostly, but said folks in the area. They said they stayed on the good side. Now, the small family, the Millers, was some mighty good folks. So everybody around them loved them. So they loved seeing them at preaching, prayer meetings, you know, get together and to do's and so on. But there was something about them folks that nobody knowed. They held a secret. Yeah, the Millers was mighty good folks. But people, they say, you know, from time to time, they got, you know, they hear them talking, laughing, and stuff like that, way up into the night, which was kind of unusual back then. Back in them days, most folks was in bed early because they had to be up early to start working or start working out in the fields and stuff. But weren't completely heard of, so folks basically just ignored it. Well, one day, the Confederate soldiers. Big old troop of them was a walking through that area, marching stuff, going to the next town over. When they was ambushed by some Union troops due to a spy. Well, during that ambush, three soldiers that was good buddies made it out alive. They was the only ones. They said they was the only ones that made it out by playing dead. See, when the Union troops moved out, they did too in the blanket of the night. Said they walked for a spell through them old woods and stuff. And all of a sudden, 
a real low light come into view. The light come through a window. It was the miller's home. I said them soldiers figured they'd bust in, take what they could, and then skin out before dawn. When I said they got close to the house, and got on their bellies, slowly crawled up that old window. So they got up there, eased up and peeked in, and had a complete shock. So they couldn't believe their eyes. See, when they looked in, said, there they was talking, the Millers, you know. I said, then Mr. Miller walked over, moved the reading table, pulled up a little old escape hatch like, and some escaped slaves had come up to eat. A man, woman, a little gal come up out of that little makeshift basement. And they sit over there in the corner out of direct light and other windows and stuff and eat. Said them soldiers in a furious rage busted in the door. Had their weapons raised, scaring everybody half to death. And one of the soldiers, real young fella, said, Boy, youngs are in a whole heap of trouble. I'd lay my rations on it. I said, you'll all swing for this. So old Mr. Miller started to explain to them that they just did because they didn't think that was right. Things like that. They didn't deserve to be treated that way. He said, when they turned that gun and hit him with the stock of the rifle, and knocked him down. Well, I said they was talking. He decided they was going to wait till the first light. And one of them would make his way into camp and tell the general. Said he ordered them all to sit together on the floor. I said after a while, said them soldiers, they got talking stuff and whispering things. Well, I said that old man said he grabbed his weapon and aimed it at him. Said maybe we'll just take one of them out. Just to show you why you don't do this. Teach them a lesson, you know. Well, I said them folks were sitting there wiping tears. They was so scared. I said he started walking over there toward where the, the side of where the youngins was. Well, I said about that time, I said that door busted open. And a cloaked figure stood there. I said he turned around to aim, but it was gone. I said all of a sudden now, I said this was a calm night. I said all of a sudden a big old gust of wind just rushed in. Blowed out the flame on the lamp and the candles. It was dark. So them soldiers in a, in a panic, boys, and oh, so they didn't know what to do. Said so they heard something behind them all of a sudden. Said so they turned around trying to see what it was. Said so all of a sudden the light just appeared, just illuminated. Said so it was the old witch woman. Says you sitting there staring at him with quote. So there the witch stood looking upon us with a gaze that was completely absent of fear, cowardice, or regret. I have faced battalions, but never have I been so scared as I was that night I raised my rifle to that witch. And she stood like a stone when she should have been running like a whip pup. That is the last of my recollection. Said the witch just stood there. And now all of a sudden, says she just wrinkled her brow and mumbled. And then the soldiers just started to get lost in the daze, just start off into nothing. Says she walked over and whispered into each one of them's ear. Said they dropped their weapons, turned around, slowly walked out of the house and into the darkness of the night. Said both families just stared, she said. Said, just bury them guns and never speak of this ever again for any reason. Now, Miss Darla that sent this in said she was the descent of the little Miller boy. 
Said his ma and pa died, and never spoke of it. As legend goes. Said him and his sister, that even when they'd be out playing or something, they never spoke of it. Said only he did on his deathbed. If the old feller hadn't, this would just be another amazing story in history that would just be lost to time.